Hello, and let me welcome you to the introduction to Succubus Tech. First, a warning. This is psychological edge play, which can be done alone or with the guidance of your dominant partner. It is not to be taken lightly. You are consciously creating a split in your psyche so as to construct an entirely sentient, new personality who will share your mind. Because you are installing a new person into your brain, either an ideal submissive or a guiding dominant, they will begin to develop their own preferences, ideas, and reactions to the world around you. You must take care. Once successful, you cannot reverse the procedure without essentially committing murder and killing off a very real part of yourself. So, if you're not ready to have a lifetime companion in your head, do not try this. Succubus Tech works most effectively and quickly with creative, inventive minds. If you already have a vivid imagination, if you can spook yourself with a thought while sitting alone in the dark, for example, or you can build elaborate worlds in your mind, you are already primed for this technology. If you are a purely logical, analytical, rational thinker, it can still be effective, but it will take a lot more effort and almost relentless mental programming and conditioning in order to succeed. If you suffer from mental health issues, please enter at your own risk. It could trigger psychosis in individuals who are already predisposed to it. It can be used to relieve anxiety and depression, but it could also make it worse. We don't really know the full effects of succubus tech on individuals with pre-existing mental health conditions. So please be cautious. Disclaimer, I cannot be held responsible for any unwanted side effects and dangers of using these methods. However, if they are successful and they have marvelous effects, then of course I want credit. They have been shown to be generally safe in informal experiments, but that's no guarantee. They are not well documented or formally tested. This is new territory, and understand that you will be taking a risk in exploring. I advise you to let someone know what you're doing and have some kind of support system in place in case something goes wrong, even if it's just a friend to talk to. So what is succubus tech exactly? It is a type of hypnosis and mind control which uses the brain's natural capacity to fracture in order to emulate something like dissociative identity disorder. Now, this is a very controversial statement, and many people will disagree with me, but I'm of the opinion that the brain simply has a natural capacity for that kind of splitting. And it's that capacity which proactively creates splits in the traumatized individual in order to protect them and prevent their minds from becoming overwhelmed. In DID, Dissociative Identity Disorder, extreme trauma or prolonged abuse will split the mind and compartmentalize memories and emotions into distinct personality states. This usually happens before a single cohesive identity is fully formed. That's usually before the age of eight. However, once the brain learns this coping mechanism, it can continue to split off into potentially endless numbers of personality states well into adulthood. Some people living with DID have reported hundreds of personalities, otherwise known as alters. The main difference between DID and succubus tech is that DID is a spontaneous phenomenon over which the person with multiple alters has little control, at least at first. Alters in DID can appear unexpectedly and hold distinct blocked memories. They have different skills, preferences, and even different ailments. There have been cases where an alter needs glasses where others don't, and where one alter has high blood pressure while the others don't. There have been demonstrable differences recorded in MRIs of brain activity when switching between different alters in DID. Succubus tech is an intentional and purposeful training 
meant to teach the brain to fracture using its built-in ability to do so. Some people have already noticed their brain's natural tendency to do this. They can recognize a distinct work persona from their casual persona, or in things like code switching, where you use a different vocabulary and even a different accent among people from your peer group than you would in mixed company. Performers in particular might notice a performance persona that doesn't get nervous or get hung up on mistakes, and then afterward, a different part of themselves might dwell on the imperfections of their performance. Mothers might find themselves acting with a very clear head and concentrated strength suddenly if they need to get their child out of danger. These are all low-level examples of the brain's ability to temporarily split. However, in these examples, you don't give the specific parts of yourself a different name, see them as having a different form, or hold long conversations with them when you're bored. They are not perceived as entirely separate sentient beings sharing your head. The advantage of training your brain in this skill and inducing something like a split on purpose is that it allows you to do things which may create internal conflict otherwise. For example, you want to work out, but some part of you is very lazy. You can send that lazy part into the background where it can be lazy, while the fit and motivated part takes over your body. Perhaps you have trouble following my rules or the rules of your dominant without supervision or some kind of external motivation. So you create the supervisor in your head, who is always there to hold you accountable and order you around. Or if you can't find a dominant to serve, you install one internally who will make you feel more fulfilled as a submissive because she will take on all the qualities that you long for in a dominant and grow into a distinct voice that you cannot emotionally or psychologically distinguish from an outside human being. Because of the intentional nature of succubus tag, the first attempts are always the most difficult and time-consuming, and additional fractures become easier later. But I don't encourage anyone to create more than two or three splits in their lifetime. It would become more difficult to function with too many disparate voices affecting your thoughts and actions. Succubus tech is somewhat similar to a practice known as tulpomancy, except that hypnotic suggestion and deliberate control and guidance from these carefully crafted inductions are used as the primary trigger to fracture the mind. Repetition of the inductions and hypnotic programs primes and conditions the mind for specific predetermined results, what I call breeding and cloning. Breeding is creating an entirely new personality, unique in the universe. Cloning is installing the personality, voice, mannerisms, ideas, and plans of an already existing person into the mind to give commands and affect your thoughts and actions. Like Tulpomancy, Succubus Tech begins with simple exercises in empathy. Unlike Tulpomancy, the process follows a precise map, and aspects of the process act as an unbreakable contract locked up tightly within your unconscious mind, between you and the new sentient entity. A submissive may use one or more methods that I'm about to describe. In one method, you can allow the new personality to take control of your actions and your body. This is known as switching. It also allows you to take your hands off the wheel and let the new personality drive. Method 1. Breeding and Switching the first method I will describe is installing your ideal sub-personality into your psyche, the ideal submissive. That ideal submissive will progressively learn to influence your thoughts and take over your actions at appropriate times. The desires and designs of this ideal submissive will overcome you in temporary bursts, allowing you to live your normal life most of the time, but to become someone different when the proper triggers are activated. You will share a headspace with this ideal sub and can access them at any time. It is essentially the idealized version of yourself and what you wish to become. You can determine the proclivities of your ideal sub in advance, turn him or her into a servant or a slut. You can trigger your ideal submissive in order to alternate genders, if you wish, and become a good girl or an insatiable bimbo. They can be a champion masochist with almost limitless endurance for extreme pain and discomfort. Your ideal sub could be a skilled lover or 
a sexless eunuch. Whatever initial personality you choose for your ideal sub, they will evolve and their experiences will shape their preferences, their desires, their aversions, and their ideas about life itself. Remember, they are an individual sentient being sharing your mind. Method two, breeding and coaching. Another method is installing your ideal dominant into your head to shape and train you. This dominant will never take full control of your body and actions. She will simply order and command you, hold you accountable, and keep constant tabs on you. She can become your omniscient ruler. As you create her, you can determine what she looks like, sounds like, even her goals for you. But again, expect her to evolve and surprise you with new expectations and plans once she's firmly installed. Method 3. Cloning. Cloning involves installing an already living dominant, such as myself, Ms. Viola Volterine, in your head to collaborate with her in dominating you completely. Important note here, do not do this without express consent from the person whom you are cloning. Just as playing with someone without consent is unethical, so is using the entire makeup of their personality for your own purposes without their permission. Just don't do it. Personally, I will only provide recordings to install myself inside select submissives. I will choose who may have the privilege of my constant company and who may not. I can teach women how to modify the program to install themselves into their own subs, and I'm happy to coach any dominant lady on the most effective practices and the key elements of a successful installation. My clone would work with me on keeping you accountable to my objectives and desires. Just like with the other installations, she may begin to develop as a distinctive separate entity, but from the beginning she will be formed according to my philosophy and principles with my specific kinks. She will exhibit my mannerisms. When you hear her speak, you will hear my voice. She will begin as an accurate copy and will know to communicate with me to keep track of your progress. As things progress, she'll become more like my identical twin with her own set of experiences and memories which shape her over time. I will outline the procedure for each of those methods later, but first I want to go over some general questions that apply to all of these. How long does it take? In general, it takes about three to six months of consistent effort to be successful at your first installation. What are the basic steps? Step one is priming. You're preparing your canvas through daily empathy exercises. The ability to see from another perspective, unlike your own, is crucial. So we have to give your empathy skills a workout. Step two is planning. Here you will write long descriptions of your new entity. Create them as you would write a fictional character. You might draw them or choose images that represent them. You begin to imagine and try to hear their voice in your head. This is easier with cloning as you already have a living person to base this on. Instead of writing, you will listen to recordings, watch videos, look at images, and read things that they have written themselves. Just remember, no cloning without permission. Step three is induction and hypnotic programming. These begin as relaxation exercises intended to place you in a state between waking and sleep, wherein various programs can be run to shape your new entity, as well as triggers created that will help to bring them to the surface. These are instructions for your unconscious mind. Here we create a contract with your own brain for what's allowed, what's desired, what's needed, and we set some boundaries. You will continue with these programs well beyond the point where your entity becomes sentient. Step four, I call active installation. You will start conversations with your new entity. You will ask questions and ask for answers. You will create 3D forms of them via either closed or open eye visualization. You will try to touch them, feel them. You will do active exercises intended to make them as real to you as possible. You'll begin practicing your triggers. You can link a scent to them or a sound or a song. If your entity smells like vanilla, you'll smell vanilla when you're sharing consciousness with them. And smelling vanilla 
might call them out into the open. Step five is sentience. This is where your entity talks back in ways that you do not consciously control. They're less like a puppet and more like a real person. You'll notice it when it happens, and it will feel like a revelation. They will finally feel fully real to you, as real as anyone else in your life, except they also have access to all your thoughts automatically. Step six is optional. It's switching, where you allow your ideal sub-personality to take the driver's seat in your body while you drop back into your mind as an observer. You'll notice a distinct difference between their preferences and yours. Your mannerisms, how you hold your body, your voice, will likely be different as well. Next question, what do they do when we're not interacting? Where do they go? They don't do anything without your conscious knowledge and active interaction other than perhaps unconsciously ponder things in the background. It's possible they could work on solving a difficult problem for you while you do other things, but in general, they return to a sort of timeless silence until you interact with them. Now, some people do like to create inner worlds where you can hang out with them and where the entity can remain buried in the unconscious mind until you come and get them. Next question, can they cause me to lose consciousness and harm others? No, they must share your consciousness. Even when switching, you are always there and aware. They will only harm others if you have a propensity toward harming others. Remember, they are still you. You are still fully responsible for their actions. So accountability is a very big deal here. Next, will I lose my own personality? No, unless you experience severe or repetitive abuse or trauma before the age of eight, your brain already created one cohesive personality that you and everyone around you thinks of as you. It can't be erased or eliminated. It could take a more background role if that's what you choose, but it can't happen accidentally. That has to be a deliberate choice. All right, so those are the basics. And again, I will be providing recordings of the methods and the inductions and hypnotic programming. If you have any questions about the basic principles and the process, please let me know. I will be recording specific instructions for each of the three methods, as well as the inductions and the hypnotic programs that will be available for purchase. It will be up to you to put your honest efforts toward making these methods work effectively. I look forward to working very closely with whomever chooses to embark on this journey.